Welcome again to New Game Plus. We are a retro gaming podcast where three guys spend seven days playing one old game and then we talk about it. My name's Dustin. My name's Kenny. And I'm Nolan. And this is episode 40, and I am unbelievably excited because of the guest that we have for this episode. I want to introduce you, our viewers, to Jeff Rubin. Hello! We are so glad that you're here, Jeff. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself to our viewers? Uh, sure. My name is Jeff Rubin, uh, and I host a podcast called The Jeff Rubin at Jeff Rubin Show, uh, where I interview people and stuff, and it's pretty dorky. <laughs> pretty dorky but pretty amazing i've been oh, pretty uh i've been caught on the uh dr batman episodes oh yeah 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 i mean okay so basically the theme of the show is that i just i mean the thing is that i just i always have trouble describing it because i just interview people who i want to interview and just because of like who i am and my interest that often skews dorky but you are speaking of a uh, dr will brooker who first came to my attention because he uh writes he wrote his PhD thesis on Batman and the character of Batman and the history of Batman <laughs> and how uh, Batman reflects um, the era that he's in. And uh, I was like, oh, that's a good one. I think it's like one of the first like I've done a lot. I always think of like the first like 10 or 20 episodes of the podcast because those are just like the first ideas I had and like the ones I was the most excited to do right at the beginning. And he's one of those. Um, and then, like, you know, they're always releasing new Batman stuff. So whenever, like, so when Dark Knight Rises came out, we checked in with him. Um, and last year, this year, this year, when um, Batman vs. Superman came out, we checked in with him. And he's been on the show a few times. He's just, like, a great, great guest. Yeah, has a lot of input about Batman. But I'm pretty sure that you you kind of match him in your Batman No, knowledge. no, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. <laughs> that dude, I mean, I know a lot about, like, Batman since I've been alive, maybe. And honestly, like, I read the comics as a kid, but, like, I don't know what's going on in the comics now. I have some, I have some sense, but I'm not, like, following it week to week. Uh, but he's read, like, like he went, and he talks about this in one of the episodes, but like, he went to, like, the archives at DC and read, like, every single, like, panel with Batman in it. Like, he's read right. everything, amazing. you know? Um, he, he's, he's really an authority. I just, like, happen to like Batman a bunch. That's so great. Uh, yeah, he's a fun guest. Always fun to talk to him. Okay, you also you were uh, you worked with College Humor years ago. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You ha you had uh, like I mean I don't I don't want to make either of us sound old, but like I think it was like a decade ago, if not longer, that I question. was watching. Whoa, <laughs> is it? I believe it. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it bleep bloop. You're talking about Bleep Bloop, which is a show I used to do. Yeah, with my, and with my Nerd book. Alert. Both and of Nerd those. Alert. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, but Bleep Bloop was the one we did more of, and that was it's a good question i don't think it's quite a decade old yet but it will okay. be it will be pretty soon i know that i know that i was watching college humor before i was in college so it, it's been it's been some years and bleep bloop was a show that you had on college humor that reoccurring series where you would bring on like other guests and people from the office and y'all would play some obscure or weird game yeah 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 that's right uh yeah it was fun i mean i basically like somehow talked them into letting me uh like play video games with my friend and like make that a part of my job so it was great yeah it's a pretty cool job well we haven't done this before but i thought it would be beneficial and fun to ask you a series of unrelated questions about yourself kind of in a rapid fire manner All right. and and you you can answer as quick and concise as you can it doesn't have to just be one word but are, are you are you down for the challenge yeah let's let's give it a shot all right, let's do this. What television series are you currently watching? Uh, I just started the new season of Orange is the New Black. That's a great question for me because I watch basically an hour of television every day. No more, no less. And I always have like one project I'm working on and it is current. So I, I will always have an answer to that question. Favorite game show of all time? Who? Uh, I don't know. I do like game shows, but I don't know that I have one that stands out. You know, when I was a kid, I really liked... Uh, like Nick, the Nickelodeon game shows, and I've done a lot of podcasts about them. We did one about Guts. We did one about um, Legends of the Hidden Temple. You asked for like quick rapid fire. I'm like already going on a tangent. <laughs> like going I think it's depth. Legends of the Hidden Temple. I think I had to think about it, but it's it's definitely a Nickelodeon show. So I think it's probably Legends of the Hidden Temple. I like I love those Nickelodeon game shows. They really worked for me when I was a kid. Good answer. Sure. Favorite board game and why is it Catan? Oh shit! Come on, man. You can't. This can't be rapid fire. If you're gonna be asking me about my favorite board games, it is probably Catan. I love. I, I've gotten really into board games in the past like four years, four or five years, and Catan was definitely like the gateway drug for me there. And I think 
the thing that makes Catan, even as I find other board games that I may even enjoy more than Catan, especially at this point that I've played so much, now that I've played so much Catan, what I do love about Catan and the reason it is the gateway drug is uh, it's very accessible. Uh, like it's just got like the right amount of everything. It's like the right amount of um, compl. It's just the right amount of complicated. Like you can sit people down and like by the end of the game they'll get it and they'll be having fun. And like even other better board games, it takes a few runs to like figure out how to win or whatever. But Catan, like you can kind of just get in the swing of things pretty quickly. And it's got like this social interaction. Oh my god, dude, I could talk about this forever. I'll, I'll just I, like I'm. <laughs> Physically cutting myself off, even though I have a lot more to say on the subject. We'll have you on a different time just to talk about board games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Catan's really good, but it really um, is. In, in the non-Catan division, I've recently been playing a lot of Agricola, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, and Codenames is a really great... Uh, also, in the Cat- Codenames is this game that's like kind of closer to Taboo than it is to Catan. You know, it's like words and English guessing. And it's by uh, Vladimir Shotville, who designed like some hardcore board games like Mage Knight. And but now he designed this game that's like twenty bucks, and it's like a pretty simple word game that's like totally for normal humans. Like there's no Mage Knights in it or anything. It's just words and like it's a word guessing game, and it's really really fun. Um, and I, I highly recommend it. I love that Catan is in its own division of board games. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just like. Uh, I mean, this. Watch me segue here, guys. You're talking to an expert podcast host. It's it's like the Mario of ah. the this, in a lot of ways. To me, I I'm, I don't know as much about board games as I know about video games. But one of the things I love about Mario and Mario Worlds is just like the blueprint for like every other game that like followed. Um, and Catan it doesn't quite have that role. Like board games have existed for a long time before Catan. Um, but I don't I don't know. It introduced me to a lot of different concepts. Anyway. Sure. It, it's, it's a region. Right. I, I kind of cut into my own segue at the end, but yeah, love it. No, and we're going to come back to that segue, but I, I, w- I have a few more rapid fire questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What Hogwarts house would you be sorted into? I don't know. Gryffindor. Cause like I'm the main character of yeah. my, <laughs> I think of myself yeah. as the main character of my own <laughs> life. And that's like what right. it is. I like Harry right. Potter. I read all the books. Like I don't, I, I, I mean, all right. The question is basically Gryffindor or Slytherin, right? Like, who? No one picks the other two, and then right. it's like, I guess I'm a Hufflepuff. good guy, right? I don't think of myself as like one of the one of the antagonists. I'm the protagonist in my own sure. story, so I, I'm gonna sure. go Gryffindor. What did you think of the Lost finale? Oh, I love. That's another tough one for me uh, to be brief on. I, I actually like the Lost finale. It's like not totally great, but it's like sort of crazy, which I love, and it doesn't like. I don't know. It doesn't totally land. Uh, the whole last season of it doesn't land, especially like the last five minutes. But I think it wrapped it up about as well as like the big beautiful mess that is lost could have been wrapped up, which is not Agreed. great. Like it's 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 not good. It doesn't wrap it up very well. But considering like again, just like just what a sprawling thing lost was at that point. That that was about as good as you were gonna do. And like I loved. I remember, like, the watching the finale with, like, a lot of people. Like, I don't watch sports, and I don't like award shows, so I really don't get to participate in a lot of, like, cultural events like that. But I remember, like, the Lost Finale party, and I remember the part where Jack and uh, Locke jump at each other, right, on a mountain. It's not Locke anymore. Oh, it's yeah, the smoke yeah, yeah. monster is taken on Locke's form or something like that. And... Then, uh, that, and um, they jump at each other, and then it cuts to commercial. And I remember it was just all, all, like the reaction in the room, and like the energy, and everyone just like gasping. <laughs> and I, even I bet even if you watch that now, if you like binge watch Lost, that moment won't play because there's no commercial there. But I just remember like f- like freaking out, like like it was like the Super Bowl or something. It was like a big moment. And um, right. So even though like it's pretty stupid and like I don't know afterlife or whatever, it's a little too metaphysical for. I like Lost when I think most people, a lot of people anyway, like Lost when it's more about the hard science. But in the end, it, uh, I don't know. It's like, I, I, I just love loss. I don't know what to tell you. Sure. I do too. Let's, uh, let's move a little bit quicker here. Do you like Ender's Game, the book? Yeah, I do like Ender's Game, the book. What did you think of the movie? Um, I like kind of forgot there was a movie until you specified Ender's Game, the book. Like I definitely <laughs> didn't like it, but to be honest, I completely forgot about it already. Yeah, yeah. let's not talk about it. Uh, one, one of the favorite guests that you've interviewed for the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin show. Oh, man. You got, you're asking me to move quick. I mean, I love Scott, my friend Scott, uh, who's like one of my best friends since childhood, who runs a pizza tour, uh, is like in many ways like the inspiration for like the model of person I look for just because he like is so enth- – he's like – everyone likes pizza, but he took his love of pizza to like this whole new level and like harness it into something positive. And like I love looking for people that did that. And Scott's sure. sort of the, the blueprint for that kind of person for yeah. my podcast, I think. 
Who's your favorite superhero? Growing up, I like Green Lantern. I like Batman. Do you consider yourself a cinephile? Uh, no, I actually don't, but I like movies. Do you consider yourself a bibliophile? Uh, no, but I like books. Probably I like movies better than books, sorry. No, that's fine. Do you consider yourself knowledgeable of pop culture? Oh, yeah, definitely. Knowledgeable of useless facts? Uh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I thought that was, that's the same question as pop culture. Pop culture is useless facts. <laughs> There's some overlap for sure. Favorite Final Fantasy? Uh, not a huge fan of the series, but three, uh, the American three, the Super Nintendo one is, yeah. is a really good one for me. And Tactics. You were doing really well. You almost got to be Dustin's friend. <laughs> and now it's over. I also like Tactics quite a bit, but I'm not too yeah. good at Final Fantasies. Sure. Favorite Elder Scrolls? Uh, not, I actually don't like the Elder Scrolls series at all. I've never gotten into them. I tried Skyrim, and I was just like, I don't, I, not for me. I don't know. All right. Interesting. All right. Finally, what is your favorite Mario title? Here we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's probably this one, Mario World, maybe three. You can maybe make a case for three. But I think if you put a gun to my head, it's Mario World, which is why I selected it for today's episode. That's the game that we played this past week, and we did so willingly, and we did so joyfully. And now, for the remainder of this episode, we're going to talk about the game Super Mario World. Overview. Super Mario World was released by Nintendo in 1990 in Japan and 1991 in the U.S. It was produced by the famous Miyamoto and a team of only 16 people. It is the fifth installment in the series, and it was actually bundled um, with the SNES as a launch title. This was Yoshi's first appearance in the series. Um, there's also a multiplayer aspect where you take turns playing as Mario and Luigi between the levels and between losing a life. In this game, you progress through different areas or worlds, each one having a different theme. So you have the Twin Bridges, Forest of Illusion, Chocolate Island, etc. And according to HowLongToBeat.com, the game provides about five and a half hours of gameplay and over ten if you're a completionist like Dustin. And that's all 96 exits. That's blowing my mind that that's how long the game is. In my mind, it's like, I, I would guess like 20, it's like this epic quest. Like right, that, yeah. I, I, It never occurred to me that, that that's really not that much uh, time. For for an older game, it's pretty impressive. It like, is. We run into games sometimes that are like, you play the whole game through in like an hour and 20 minutes if you do it flawlessly. For this game, you don't just, uh, for me, I don't just play the stage one time. You know, especially if you're a completionist, you've got to play some stages multiple times just to get the 96 exits. But, I mean, part of this is going back to the Star World and picking up another Yoshi and then going back into, you know, you know into it all. So, like, I, I say that, I mean, I spent more than 10 hours on it this week and still didn't beat it. So, I, I think it's definitely something that can play a lot more time than that. I agree, yeah. That was just kind of like... I don't know if that's like the average or if that's just what like the developer said there's 10 hours of gameplay but usually I use that website to to kind of gauge how long sure how how many gameplay hours you can get out of something and yeah I thought it was a little fishy 10 seems really low to me too I'm going to say in in practical childhood like experience hours it's actually more like three whole summers or something <laughs> right so. exactly I mean one reason I selected this game is just cuz like it's hard to separate my uh, feelings for this game with how uh, and how good it is with just like when it came out in my life, which is just when I was like, I mean, what year did the game come out? 1991. So I was nine years old. So just like prime video game age, you yeah, know, to like timing. really like tear up Mario World and just spend endless hours playing Mario World. And uh, but I so even though the game's only five or ten hours long, there's no doubt in my mind I put a hundred, maybe two hundred hours into it. And video games were different then. Like when I got Mario World, it's like that was one of a f small handful of cartridges that would go in the system. But now there's like demos and free to play stuff. Like you're, I would finish it and move on a little quicker. But just because of when it came out and the fact that I was nine years old, I like played it over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah. So, so so expand a little bit because you could have chosen any retro game, any game that was 15 years old or older, and you chose Super Mario World. Why is that? You know, it's also like if you look at my youth and like my these my prime video gaming years of like nine to fourteen or something, which is funny because I still probably play as much, if not more, games than I ever did. But 
Um, <laughs> in like my prime video gaming like youth, like Super Nintendo is kind of it. Like Nintendo sort of always existed. Like I was pretty young when it came out, but I don't remember like the release of it. Like it was just basically always existing as far as I can recall. But Super Nintendo is like the one I can like remember when it came out. And it came out when I was a kid. So Super Nintendo is like a really like uh, just... Uh, the the dominant system of my prime video gaming years and Mario is just like the blueprint like I said for basically every single Super Nintendo game you know and I'm kind of interested right. to hear about your experience playing it this week because it is like so influential for like a long period of video games but I don't know how much that influence remains today now that platformers are like to, to be generous not the dominant genre anymore right. and um, I still suspect there's a lot in Mario World and it's such like a, a masterpiece that there's like a lot that you can see in other games but certainly it's like influence it's like um it's like sublime sublime was really good right but like no one sounds like sublime today like the fact is like there's not a, people people were really into sublime in the 90s but the fact is like they weren't that influential and like now there's not a lot of bands that sound like sublime and i'm wondering if mario is like sublime in this situation hmm. uh, let's let's go into our gameplay section and talk about our collective experiences with said game this past week Gameplay. So most are familiar with Super Mario World. It's not for 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 our viewers especially. This is not going to be a stranger. Like that, that it's going to be a welcomed friend, I'm sure. And so we will kind of quickly explain the premise of how Super Mario World is played, but then we'll spend more time talking about our experience with the game. So any of you, feel free to explain kind of how this game works. Kenny's got it. Uh, well, this is classic Mario. I mean, uh, you're running around platforming, uh, fighting, you know, little shell-bearing creatures and flying things and uh, upgrading your character with uh, mushrooms and powers. And um, it, it's it's pretty typical Mario fare. Uh, the one sort of really new and unique thing in this game that sort of became enduringly classic is, is Yoshi. Yoshi! Yoshi! Um, who is just, you know, like, instant icon. If you want to achieve that status, getting stuck into the middle of a uh, Mario game is probably a great way to do it. Uh, but I had a, an interesting experience with this game because I, I knew it by reputation. Um, but the it, it's actually a weird hole in my childhood gaming. Like, I never played this game, really. Really? At all. So you, yeah. did, you didn't so have I a had, physical can, copy of it like you do some of these other games we play. Uh no, I don't I don't own a Super Nintendo. Oh. Like I Did you have old... Genesis? Were you a Genesis kid? Uh I had a I had an uh, an original NES and that was probably the the majority of my gaming and then did do a little bit of Genesis and then went PlayStation after that. And I don't know why. Like I had friends and things that had the Super and we just never did. And so there's some titles that I'm really familiar um on the SNES and this isn't one of them. I knew it by reputation. But again, um I sort of assumed, you know, pff, you know, everyone thinks it's a great game, but, you know, Super Mario 3 is where it's at. It's not going to hold a candle to, you know, to my pri prior experiences. And um, unsurprisingly, I was uh, I was impressed. It, it's a great, great title. That's cool. That's cool to hear that it holds up, even like for someone who doesn't have the nostalgia for it. This game does a lot of unique things that some of the other the other Mario's don't do. So, so some of the things that it does do, it's a platformer. You move from the left to the right for the most part. You uh, you, you defeat enemies, as Kenny just said, and uh, if and, and each area concludes, e each major area concludes with a castle and a boss fight. So that's fairly standard for. Uh, for, except outside of the boss fight, um, that 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 was kind of new. But um, also in, in this one, uh, so you've got a world map. Which did you? Ha well, you kind of had that in some of those. Yeah, uh, three, has map. Mario three has a map. Yeah, three has it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you do. The thing that's different about this one is that, uh, or what I think about when I think about it is that it was like persistent and it was it was more epic because Mario one and Mario three, you had to be in it one sitting. It didn't have saving. So, like, you couldn't just casually, like, knock out a level or something. You had to clear out an afternoon and be like, I am going to attempt to beat the game. Whereas this right. was more of, like, an ongoing thing, kind of like Zelda in a way, where you could, like, check in and move it forward a little bit. And um, that is maybe the thing, like, the thing about it that was new at the time that is uh, still in games today. You know, like, you wouldn't make a game... There's, there's very, I don't think there's very, there's very few games today where you have to like sit down and beat it all at once, you know. Sure. And like this is yeah. one of the first games where you didn't have to do that, and I think that made it a lot more approachable. 
um, than other Marios. And and I have to guess that that was in part due to Miyamoto because he created both series. And so you, it was interesting you threw Zelda in there. Like I'm sure he was suggesting, look, let's let's come up with a way that they can like progress through this awesome, beautiful overworld map and not have to do it every time. Right, right, right. I'd have to attribute that to him because he's just brilliant. And also the game is just like now epic enough. The game is long enough now that you can't, it's like five hours. You can't beat right. that in one sitting. Unless and like, you're the game runner. is finally, <laughs> right, but the, the game is finally like big enough that um, they, it's, it's almost just a practical concern. Like people can't beat this in one sitting. We have to like serve this out in a, a different portion size. Yeah, but so on the world map, some of the stages are the stages are represented by colored circles. For the most part, there's also ghost houses and castles, as I've already said. But most of your stages are little little circles, and most of them are yellow dots. But some are represented by red dots, and those red dots mean that you can finish that stage multiple ways, and that there's there's multiple paths, usually just two paths that come off of that dot and move to somewhere else on the world map. And as Nolan mentioned in the overview, there are are a total of 96 exits in this entire game exits from the various stages there's not 96 stages but there's 96 exits and uh, for for those that want to finish the entire game want to complete the entire game that's going to take multiple multiple hours trying to find all of these exits and if you don't know them already uh, then you're in for a challenge which is exceptionally fun to me right and think about how much content that is for for how old this game is you know, you, you've got DLC that comes out like regularly now for for these new games. And it's what, uh, maybe a few extra hours of gameplay. But this game, the base game, has that much content to explore. That's That blows my mind that they went into that much detail. How many patches did they have to do to get the game working properly? <laughs> Exa- yeah, right. <laughs> uh, kind of Just, another funny thing about it, or another interesting thing about it is like, it has, I, I love, <laughs> I guess, spoiler alert, there is, like, um, the Star World with, like, the really crazy levels that all right. have some, like, weird twist that's, like, not really how the game works, you know? Yeah. They're almost mm-hmm. like the Mario Maker levels you see today where someone, like, makes soccer in Mario Maker or does, like, a yeah. jump in Mario Maker or whatever. Like, there, those Star World levels are almost kind of like that. Like, there's one where you have to, like, that all revolves around, like, Balloon Mario, and it's almost like a little flying game. And um, the the levels are kind of like gnarly and like groovy and stuff. Tubular. And it's just like, I I like the game as like a straightforward path, but it also has um, some pretty interesting and gnarly little like outposts and like secrets (laughs) and stuff. And I wish I've got the 96 gates and you get a star when you get 96 gates. And I got, I did that. I don't even know how many times. I, I I don't even know, but like many many times, five or six at least. Like I would just like rec- you know you had several slots, and I just like would start over and just do that. And uh, I like if I if I picked up the game now, I'm extremely confident I could get 96 gates, and I know ex- basically where everything is. There's like one or two ones in the chocolate forest that I always get tripped up on, but like I'm pretty confident I could like smoothly run through the game. Um, yeah, like I played it. Yesterday. See, I wonder. I wonder if it's the same for you as I had talked to a guy this week that he said for the most part this game is just muscle memory at this point. Yeah, yeah, at this yeah. Point. That- like you you turn on the game, put a controller in his hand, and for the most part, he's just doing it without much thought. That's why I was so excited about Mario Maker, because it's like, ooh, new Super Mario World to play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's crazy how long that lasts, like with games. Cause it literally is you will just react like like you've trained yourself to, and even years later. Uh, I've found those titles that I've played excessively, you know, like beyond reason, that you can sit back and pick them up years, years later, and your hands just move. Yeah, it's yeah. I picked up um, I, another game I potentially could have chosen for this podcast that might not quite be 15 years old is Amplitude. I played a ton of Amplitude, and the Kickstarter-funded reboot recently came out, and I picked it up, and I could not believe how... I was, like, able to do expert again, like, pretty quickly. Like, it's just, like, it was in my bones. Like, I I genuinely could not believe 
uh, how natural it felt, even though I hadn't played the game in like a decade. And if you've played Amplitude, not to get into it, like it's like a very, it's just like, that is the muscle memory game, you know? Like I, I was I was shocked at how just intuitively everything came back as I was playing. I, I, I haven't played Super Mario World for years and I played it a lot when I was a kid, played it some uh, maybe early in college, but uh, coming back to it, there was so much that I just remembered. As I'm going through the stage, I'm like, you know what? Above me are some clouds that I can get on and grab a key and, and that's the that's the secret exit like so often did these things just keep coming into my mind as i was playing the game and there's something special about you that. know what you know what i think that probably is because i wrote this down as what stood out to me playing it again this week it's the fluid game mechanics they are so smooth and so well done that they rival games that have come out like this year and it just makes playing the game stylish and fun. How fast you can go through the level or fly with the cape. Like the gameplay mechanics, it's what, for me, that's what makes the the gameplay so fresh every single time I play it, no matter how old it's going to get. Yeah, the game does so many like little things right, you know? Like the physics, and that's something like I felt when I picked up Mario Maker. Like the, there's a lot of things that obviously when I was playing as a nine year old, I didn't appreciate. Even now playing, I don't appreciate. But there's a great uh, video that you can go look up online of someone explaining how the camera in the game works and like all the subtleties of the camera behavior. And it's funny, you don't even mm-hmm. think of cameras in 2D games, but the way like if you go backwards, the camera doesn't immediately start following you to the left. It gives you a little give. And like all these little things that make it feel really these like very like that were decisions that were made as they were putting together the game that you don't even think about it there's so many little things that you don't even think about correctly right that's why this game i think is is so special one one of the one of the things that they did we we've mentioned the star world and on there you've got okay so not only do you have yoshi introduced in this game you have the whole yoshi family introduced in this game and so there are one of the coolest things to me as a kid was when i found on the star road colored yoshis yeah okay so you've got red yellow and blue are those the the three outside of the green one uh, yeah, I, mean, yes, I know those exist. Right. Yeah, there and, may and be one other. But each of those have a unique function and a unique ability when they when they eat uh, or hold in their mouth shells or different things. So um, the red one, for example, can uh, turn anything into fire that that it blows out. The yellow one can hold something in its mouth and then stomp on the ground, which uh, takes out the enemies around him. And then the blue one flies, right? Flies. Yes, yeah. that's right. He gets yeah. wings. Yeah, that's yeah. the coolest one to me. I like, I don't know. I like them all. That's tough. No way. <laughs> it's the fire spitting one. The fire spitting one, one I feel like Yoshi... is the least special because you get you get, you get get to spit the fire a lot in the game because I think when you spit a red shell, it turns into fire. Like you only get the yellow and the blue one. I guess the blue one is the coolest. Yeah, it, I've practical. always loved the blue one. I love that it just starts as they, they hatch as baby Yoshis. You have to grab so them cute. and feed them with right. enemies or blocks, and then they grow into a full-fledged Yoshi. Something I never Aww. fully understood about Yoshis, as even as much as I played the game, is Yoshi, like the green Yoshi, is that one person, is that Mario's friend Yoshi, or are they all Yoshi? Like, who is, is Yoshi the species, is or is Yoshi, Yoshi a, a name? This is the X-Files episode. Yeah, kind of. like, I, I don't know. I All I know is that there was one standard Yoshi in the live action, and it was this ugly, scary oh, dinosaur. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't know whether to relate this to Spartacus or Eminem. I'm not following you. Oh, uh, uh, with the real one? Standing up? Real real Slim Shady, yeah. please stand up, and That's, or Spartacus, everyone okay. playing me. It seems, like right. they're, it seems like they're a species, because you can discard them, like, you know, as has been depicted. Yeah. You can discard them, like, pretty casually, and it's fun to do so. And you, in fact, <laughs> need to do so to get one of the gates. There's one of the gates, one of the trickiest ones in the game, is you Yoshi jump underneath a gate, and then, so you, there's a gate that's, like, kind of high up, um, oh, and right, you're on a platform yeah. that's beneath it. You jump so you're underneath the gate, and then you leap off Yoshi, Did jettisoning you. <laughs> Yoshi into a pit. You can get, like, one more jump jump and jump, like, behind the gate, and then there's a second, like, hidden area. That's one of the trickiest yeah. ones in the game. So you, you actually have to do that at some point, which just makes me feel like the Yoshis are sort of, like, a species that Mario comes on, like like horses, basically. And the <laughs> cartoons and the extraordinarily non-canonical film depicted as, like, right. one creature. But that's not really what's going on. 
right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And Mario's never treated Yoshi with respect that he deserves <laughs> because not only do you jump off of him, but to get him to like s- stick his tongue out and grab whatever's in front of him, I'm pretty sure Mario punches him in the back of the head. <laughs> oh, I always looked at that as kind of like a, uh, he's pointing forward. Like like an onward thing. That's kind of how <laughs> okay. I see that that's animation. The ni- that's the nice way to think about. That's it. That's less twisted for sure. That's, oh my! I've never really even thought about it. I've never really <laughs> consciously thought about it. But when you, but I know the, I can picture the exact animation. Like I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm gonna have to go back and look <laughs> at it. That's funny. Yeah, that's dark. Hey, so uh, out of the power ups, um, main power ups being the fire flower, the cape, the I mean, I guess you've got the star that's always in there. But like, OK, so in Mario, th- it's Super Mario Brothers three, right, where yeah. you've got the suits, the yeah. swirl, the, the leaf, the uh-huh. tanuki suit, hammer the brothers. Suit. Love that. But in this one, you don't have so suits. Good. You have you have power ups. You've got the fire flower, the cape. You've got the stars you do kind of in most games. Are, are those the prime? And then you've got the mushroom that makes you larger. Sure. Right. Uh, out of those, which ones Which ones did you all use primarily? Which ones did you enjoy the most? Is it cape for everybody? Yeah, it's cape. It's, okay. it's so cape. One of my, my favorite parts of the game is there's one part pretty early on where you get the cape where you just like go down this pipe and then there's just like an area full of coins. And it's also got... I think even the sides have those corner blocks that let you run up the walls. So it's just like, go crazy caping around here, buddy. It's, Love it. You know, it's just like kind of the cape free zone. And that's one of my favorite parts of the game. And indeed in Mario Maker, when I got to play like some new cape levels, I, it was just like amplitude, like amazing how naturally the cape kind of like that dive and then you pull back to float up and just that yeah. rhythm. Like and there's that I rhythm couldn't believe it. how quickly it came back to me. And I'm not like... Yeah. I'm not, just to be clear, like not playing those insanely difficult Mario Maker levels you're seeing on the internet where you have to like exploit all these like weird physics. I'm not that good or anything, but just like, I I just like that flow. I can just picture it as I'm talking now of when you dive and then come back up. Like it's so natural to me. It's like actual physics, you know? That was one of the things that was difficult for me as a kid. But as I came back now, it took me just a few minutes to master because you can, if you, um, Mario flies up into the air, but then you can hold your cape as you come down. That's what we're talking about. And if you use your left and right on the D-pad well enough, you can actually not only maintain your height, but you can, you can go higher. Uh, so like there's a, a proper way to manage that mechanic so that you can get where you need to or bypass the whole level, which I did often. I got to admit, though, when I look at ways Mario flies, including he has a cape, he's got a raccoon tail on his butt. I got to say winged hat is probably to me. That's the one that makes the most sense. It's like, yeah, that's how Mario should get around. He should have wings on his hat. Mario 64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was really awesome. That does make sense. Although, but the, that cape function, that's a lot of fun. The cape is probably the most fun to do. You you really never, and I'm not, I actually don't know as much about Mario 64 because I actually, uh, like you and Mario were, I didn't have a 64. I went to PlayStation. I actually did go back and beat it when they re-released it for 3DS, but it, I don't know it like I know Mario World. And it, But I don't think there's quite as many. You get pretty limited use of the wing hat because that's the thing about Mario World. You can, like, store the feather in your item box and take it anywhere. Oh, yeah. But the wing hat... It's like only in very specific areas of the game do you even have access to it. And even there, you need to get like enough room to get a triple jump or whatever going. Yeah. Yeah. Out of all these stages uh, in, in the uh, Super Mario World world, <laughs> uh, w- were there any that stood out to you guys? Any that uh, like you, you think of with fondness or you think of and you're like, I hate that stage and never want to do it again? For me, it's Star World. Like, the music is so good. And I'll go to Star World just to jam that music. Um, and they are kind of funky. The stages are kind of difficult. But I always thought that was the coolest thing that that was in the game. And uh, so it's Star World for sure. Yeah, I feel like all those challenges, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like they're all, none of them are just like a hard level of Mario with like a lot of turtles. Like, they're all like a, a weird twist, which just makes it pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, it makes you think differently to progress. Doesn't Star World have a funnier name? In, like the, in the Japanese version, I mean, in the American one, it's like so 90s It's like gnarly and tubular or something. So I'm not saying yeah. like, uh, but the, it's something weird in the Japanese one. It can't possibly be worse <laughs> than what we did. But I think it is something interesting what they're called in the Japanese version. 
I, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I do know, though, that if you complete the whole star world, which is in shape of a star, then you can go to a star in the middle of that world, which takes you to uh, the special zone, which is uh, it's, it's continued star worlds, and it's some of what we've been talking about, but those are where the stages, for the most part, are relatively short. You know, They're brief yeah. in where you've got to go or what you've got to do, but it's just, as Jeff said many times, it's just uh, it's not the conventional way of completing the, the stage, which adds a whole new level of of fun jeff what's your favorite your favorite series of stages that's tough i guess i do i i I don't know i think i like the bridge level i guess i do kind of like the earlier ones and i don't think it's because they're easier i think i just like the outdoory theme better i'll tell you my least favorite i never liked the chocolate brown one like i just like some about the the colors in that one i didn't like as much a little dull yeah. And, like, I don't like the underground ones. Like, I like the ones where they're, like, in a forest or on the lake or on the bridge or whatever. Like, I, I kind of like the outdoory ones best. No, I, I totally agree. But the the one stage that I really like, uh, it's maybe in the th- – third zone i think it, it's outside uh before you go into the cave area and um there's a secret stage in the top left corner of the map and uh all you do when you go there is there's like four or five boxes that you can hit renew your power-ups get a yoshi exit to the left or the right oh and yeah then you're yeah good to yeah go again. you know what i'm talking yeah, about yeah yeah that's I, I, it's yeah, not you, much of a stage you don't have to do no, you like that's your favorite stage yeah, by far. That's the most boring thing. But you could like work yeah, back much- there to like get some power ups for like a later level, yeah. you know, and it's like a real. You hassle. can actually get to like ninety nine lives there too. That's what I used to do. I like the yeah. uh, I like the airships a lot. You know, I feel like there's a lot of good boss levels oh, and. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, how do we even not talk about this? When you're on the fence and you can hit the fence and swing around to the other side oh, of the that's fence. Brilliant. That's that's there's only brilliant. maybe two, three times. And I think the fir- in the first world, the first the castles, castles, the really good one. There's not that much of it, but that's really fun. Like, I don't know. It's almost like Donkey Kong Jr. where you're like crawling around. And you got to like manipulate where you are versus where the turtles are crawling. Oh, and it's great when you can, like, punch them through it. I forgot all about that part. Right. They did that on a 2D system. How, I know. It's really like, impressive. That's just brilliant. Yeah, you can, yeah. You, you can go to the door. You you hit it, or the door, the little uh, switch around. You hit that, and then you're on the other side of the fence. That was, like, 100% yeah. in, like, the commercials for Super Nintendo and for that game. You know, that was, like, yeah. definitely, like, a technical marvel, um, even within this game. Like, that was that was interesting. Maybe Mode 7 related? I don't know. Kenny, any that stood out to you as loving or hating? Uh, no, I think the most impressive thing for me was the variety in the levels that there, you know, that I was able to play of like design. It doesn't ever feel the same. Like they're really creative with using the mechanics that they have, and from doing the wall stuff to like having bosses that each feel unique and that you have to, you know, um, interact with well. Uh, to each of the worlds feeling like sort of its own place. I feel like the the depth of detail that they put into it um, and the creativity and design uh, along with its flawless mechanics is the one thing that just totally floored me. Understood. Well, let's see if uh, if this game has aged well. We know that it was incredible back in 1991, and I think you can probably already tell from the way that we're talking about this game how we feel, but let's not talk about how the game uh, fares today in 2016. Aged. Well, for me, like, the age of this game is silly to talk about because, I mean, there there have been many iterations since since um the original release so i've got it on wii u i have it on my wii i have it on uh game boy advance and they haven't touched it like sometimes when they come out with these games they update it and they re redo it or whatever change stuff the game is the same That's like they just point. left yeah. it um the Game Boy Advance version, they made Luigi. They gave him the, the iconic like floaty jump. In in the original, he is the exact same as Mario. So like that's the only change they ever did in the series. Like it's that speaks for itself in the fact that the original game was so good that it needs to stay the same in order to be enjoyed. And I think that playing it this week felt. It doesn't even feel like a retro game. It's just like Super Mario World. Okay, let's go. And then you play it and you don't even think and you don't even think about the age of it. And so uh, for me, 
it aged beautifully. Yeah, you you don't really think of it as like a retro game. You think of it as a family friend, <laughs> right? <laughs> because it grew up in my house with me. Like, um, I, I think it's aged beautifully. I agree. The music we haven't even mentioned much of. It's top notch. Maybe so maybe the best of any Mario game to date. What do you guys think about that statement? Uh. I'm really huge on soundtracks, so I'd right. probably be able to find something. I think the Paper Mario music is very good, but uh, no, it's amazing. Like like I've said, Star World has like the best music ever. Yeah. The the color of the stages and the characters, they're bright and vibrant. The gameplay is still addicting as ever. The only thing I would say, though, being a lot smarter at games now than I was back then when I originally played Super Mario World, I can really take advantage of some of the mechanics now uh, that, that I'm more knowledgeable of the game. So give me a Yoshi and a cape, and most of the stages stand no chance. And uh, But that's that's with any game. You play it enough and that you're going to know how to manipulate the game well enough uh- to... And Mario was never about being, like, right. an ultra-challenging game. It, you know, there needs to be enough difficulty to make it fun, and I think, you know, some of that's still there, especially when you're playing through and and, and don't know the levels and whatnot, you're kind of exploring for the first time. Um, but it's always been more about the gameplay than about exactly. beating it. You know? Like, you don't just play this game to beat it, you play it for the experience. And, in yeah. my opinion, it's an experience that is just as good today as it was in 1991. Yeah, my perspective is, again, a little unique not having played it, but I've got to say, you guys are totally right. You pick it up, you play it, it feels like it feels like a game that could have been released today with a retro vibe easily, just because it's, it's fluid and flawless and feels natural and well implemented and just it's a very, very well made game. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I love it. I mean, to me, the best part is hearing that even for someone who has no nostalgia for it, that it really holds up. That's really the test, is to, like, give it to someone who didn't play it then. Um, and, yeah, you know, I think even in the uh, great legacy of the main series of Mario titles, this is, like, I don't know. It's it's tough for me to separate it from, like, my nostalgia from when it being a kid, but I, still, I think it's, like, easily the top three, if not maybe a uh, strong case for the best one ever. There, yeah. I said it. yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think that's fair. I with this podcast in general, we have to always try to see these games uh through our nostalgic colored glasses, you know, like so that definitely has an effect and I think it should have an effect to some degree. It can't override the reality of the game for example. And uh, I no one's asking, but I'll give this anyways. My like I love Final Fantasy 7, but it was also my introduction into Final Fantasy, is in my introduction into role uh, you know RPGs. It was my introduction to the PlayStation, so all that. So I've got this nostalgia factor, but I can set that aside to some degree and say, hey, so it's not the best game. These polygons are terrible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Chocobo and racing so, is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> well, I mean, if you can, if you do it to get your golden chocobo, it's worth it. But I loved uh, it. Uh, so, like, anyways, likewise, <laughs> now I'm relating Final Fantasy VII Cloud Strife to uh, Mario World, but um, th- there's there's the same thing. You've got to look at it and you acknowledge the nostalgia. I don't think you just ignore it, but at the same time, you can set that aside. And for Kenny, who didn't have nostalgia attached to this game, and like him, you can still say, man, this game is a quality game that still holds up today. Great. I'm glad I made you guys play this one and not, like... What if I had just like pranked you and picked like a terrible game? You know, like you I, know what? I, I really Our viewers do you. that all the time. We we had a guest do that. What's one the time? worst game that someone's made you play? Super Godzilla, <laughs> Vigilante Eight, easy. <laughs> oh, I kind of have fond They're... memories of Vigilante Eight. Does it hold up? N- no. no, I don't really. I don't remember very well. Like I, I I'm the... not totally surprised, but like I, I don't remember being terrible. Even the guest that suggested the game didn't like it. <laughs> right. So, like, no, he did. Uh, he did when he was younger and he played the game. He had fond memories of it. But when he came back around and played it, we all were like, dude, this game wasn't that good. <laughs> the final shell shock. So now now in our summary section, this is what we typically do here. We, um, we either give or we hold back our vote for new game plus status, which, Kenny, explain what that means. 
Uh, New Game Plus is just sort of a thumbs up that says this is a game, even though it's old, that's worth playing today. So as simple as that, would we suggest you you pick up this game, you find a copy, and you play through again today? That's that's really what it boils down to. So we take everything that we just said and we put it into one answer. Do you give this game your New Game Plus status? Yes or no? I'll allow our guest to go first. So Jeff Rubin, do you do you give this game uh, Super Mario World your New Game Plus status? Obviously, definitely. <laughs> This may be one of the easiest ones we've ever done, so mine's yeah, a big probably yes. so. Yours is yes, Kenny. Absolutely. You know, I actually came into this episode early in the week before I got to play a bunch of the game, um, assuming that I was going to have sort of reverse nostalgia, that I was going to be wishing that this was Super Mario 3, which is probably still my favorite of the series, uh, but again, the one I got to play more, and that I was going to sort of have to compare it to that and end up you know, getting to sort of, I don't know, play devil's advocate, bring a little drama to the show and be divisive and say, you know, boss, Super Mario World or Super Mario 3 is is way better. Um, and I, I just can't because this game was good. Yeah. And like, it's, it's just a good game. So it, it gets my new game plus seal of approval as well. As it does receive mine. I, I So all across the board, I, I could almost guarantee you that if you pull up any top 100 list of greatest video games of all time, Super Mario World would be near the front of the list. Yeah. Uh, I, top I 10 for sure. For the, yeah, I think for the most part, uh, most gamers are going to agree. It's got great gameplay, great content, great characters. And then you introduce our green dinosaur friend and his family, and it's just game over. Like, this is this is a high-quality game that brings back many memories and is still very playable today. Gets all of our, new game, our, our votes for New Game Plus status and is definitely New Game Plus certified. So we, we've got a few messages from viewers this week who wrote in saying, uh, giving us their thoughts about the game. Uh, the first one is from our friend Nick, and he said this, The game has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. It's definitely a highlight in video game history. You can play the game straight through the story mode looking for the princess, but there's also a ton of extra content and hidden levels that can be very, very challenging, which I think is incredible given the system the game is on. From traveling through the different areas of Dinosaur Land to figuring out the puzzles in Star World or trying to beat the really difficult levels in Special World to unlock a new skin of the game, it never gets old. Even when I have many levels memorized, I still enjoy going back to it and replaying it over and over. I think that represents so many people. <laughs> I mean, he said it all. And I think, it, I think it's also really cool that you can beat it as fast as you want or you can take your time like for instance my, my playthrough this week was I actually looked up the speed run route like the one that doesn't have like crazy glitches you just do as few exits as possible and it still took me a long time but like the fact that you can skip to the end like that is really cool AAIIGI92 <laughs> has a Good bad name, name but, but also <laughs> said this it's probably their given name at birth uh, oh they, yeah. They said this. Oh, I would love to complete this game in all its levels, but unfortunately, I never figured out how to get down that down to that lake below the bridge and a hidden level past the first ghost house. The game can be quite cryptic on where the hidden paths to complete the levels are. I've played those two levels with a hidden route numerous times, but was unable to figure out how to find the right way to complete it. Other than that, I love this game very much. I'm a little confused. He emailed you. He did. So he obviously has the internet. Like, there's a really easy solution. I get when you were a kid playing this game, pounding your head on it. But, like, if you want to be a completionist, hit up that Google. Go get to that level you've never been to. We're not cheaters like you, Kenny. Live your Some dreams. Some people just want to figure it out on their own, Kenny. Eh. And then we got one more message from uh, Andreas saying, There is a certain affection I have for the classic Mario games. Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, 3, Super Mario World, and Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. They're games that even when you shake off the nostalgia, they are brilliant games with a rare emphasis on aesthetics and tone. Something that I came to associate with Mario, only to then sadly not see matched in later Mario games since. Which, uh, So I want to ask about that because I, I have played many Mario games. I, I did play Mario 64, but that's pretty much the last game I played. Some of you that have played uh, Mario extensively since, does that kind of 
does that aesthetic and does that tone does that hold up jeff are, are you did, did you play the future mario games uh oh yeah uh the only ones yeah no i actually think i've played all of them uh, I never beat Sunshine, and I don't think I beat either of the Galaxies, so I played a bunch of both of those. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this guy's being a bit of a curmudgeon, like, Mario 64 is a stone-cold classic by any measure, and, um, yeah. you know, I think, uh, Galaxy 1 and 2, I don't know if they're quite pan- automatically in the pantheon, like these other Marios, but they're, like, great, great games, even Sunshine has its defenders, um, and I actually mm-hmm. loved, like, really, really loved uh, Super Mario 3D World on, uh, right, is that what it's called, right? Super Mario yeah. 3D World. On the Wii U. On the Wii U, which I guess yeah, is actually weird. worth mentioning because it's, it's sort of a sequel to Super Mario World in a lot of ways, I think, mm-hmm. right? I forget. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I loved, I thought that was a- an excellent, excellent Mario game. And the, the 3DS one's pretty good, too. But this new Wii U one uh, really caught me by surprise. I think it's one of the best Marios ever. Really great. And in fact, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, came out, you know, back in the day for Super Nintendo. That game is so creative. It's so oh, good. It's yeah, like yeah, the yeah. the Crayola graphics, like the crayon drawn graphics. Incredible. It's so good. Yeah, that one is also, uh, it's also a classic. Though it's so weird and unusual that like some people, and like the core egg throwing mechanics so unusual that I feel like it doesn't resonate with some people. But for most people that it does, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Is that also Baby Mario? Yep, yep, yeah. yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, didn't resonate with me. Really? Yeah, I don't See? know why, but there was just something about about it that that I don't know just seemed too indie to me. I don't know what totally. It was. No, that's that's you, that's a that's a great observation about it. I hope a future guest picks that ep- picks that game, um, so you guys go back and revisit it because it is a great game and it's got like. Really, really great ideas. I, your criticism of it is extremely valid, but um, if you could get around it, there's a lot to like there. Yeah. So at the end of each of our episodes, we randomly select a new game from our retro master list. You can find the link on our social media sites and on our website, but um, we've got a master list that our viewers are constantly sending in new games. In fact, we got like 15 to 20 new games this week that we've got to add to the list, but uh, they're, they're all games from any system that have been uh, aged 15 years or older, and um, from that list, we're going to click a randomized and it's going to pick the game that we're going to be playing for the next seven days and uh, the one that's going to be the center of our discussion on next week's episode. But before we do that, Jeff, can you think of any other game maybe that we should add to the list? And I know you don't know what is currently on our list, but uh, are are there any games that you loved or loathed that that you think that would be good for us to play at some point? Oh, well, we just said Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. Is that on the list? Okay. I believe so, but if it's not, we'll add it. I'll tell you the other game I was really considering uh, at going back and forth on and choos- considering choosing for this week's episode is one of my favorites, uh, Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo. <laughs> Great game. That sounds interesting. Sounds awesome. I'll throw one more at you. Uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, probably two or three. So you guys have that on the list? Uh, no. I don't we, think we have two. We don't have any Tony Hawk. Oh, get think. Tony so Hawk good. on the list. I love the Tony Hawk games are all time favorites for me. That soundtrack, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the game, the soundtrack, uh, but also that gameplay. The gameplay. That's sure. like the most video gamey video game of all time. Like if you like look at what someone's hands are doing there, it's insane. You know, it's uh, a, yeah. yeah. it's just like so raw button pressing and timing. Yeah, except for me who just did like the 180 Benihana over and over and over and over <laughs> again because it gives you a lot of points. But right, right, right. Great game. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna click the randomizer and we're gonna let's see what it is. We're gonna find out. All together, what our game is for the next uh, seven days. It's a tense moment. I'm excited. Boo boo ba boo 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 ba boo 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 ba boo boo. I like that. noise a randomizer makes. You guys got a sound effect? <laughs> yeah, we do. We don't have to make it ourselves, but I think I might use yours actually. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> For the next seven days, we're going to be playing the game called Earthbound. Wow. You know, Earthbound's a real hole in my gaming knowledge. I've never played Earthbound. I bet it's, it's good. Yeah, same here. It's another it, kind of off-the-wall title, It's and it's by Nintendo. It's kind of strange, but I'm really excited that we got this. Nolan, game. isn't one of these guys, isn't one of the characters Super in... Smash Brothers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ness um, and Lucas in, in the newer ones. You can play as Lucas. It's going to be really interesting this week yeah i'm excited this is this is one of those jrpgs that i never got around to for whatever reason 
looking forward to it. Jeff, how can our viewers keep up with uh, all that you're doing? Uh, well, you can listen to the podcast at Jeff Rubin, jeffrubinshow.com. And you can find me probably just on Twitter where I'm at Jeff Rubin Show, but I'm on other, you know, social media platforms. You can find me if you look for me. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to us today. As always, connect with us throughout the week. On uh, You can find us on social media, Twitter or Facebook, NGP Podcast. You can listen directly on iTunes or Stitcher, SoundCloud, uh, even Google Play Store now. Find us on our Steam group and uh, play some games with us this week. You can always email us at ngppodcast at gmail.com. We really are looking forward to playing Earthbound next week. Jeff, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you for being our guest Absolutely. Today. Big thanks for uh, spending time with us. My pleasure. Super fun, guys. Until next time, I'm still Dustin. I'm Kenny. And I'm Nolan. And that's Jeff. And this has been New Game Plus.